Welcome to the Market Mindset. We are the hub for news, results, and CEO interviews focusing the junior commodities sector. We provide market analysis and perspective that will help position you for solid returns. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can help support us by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and clicking the notification bell. For more info, you can visit our website. All links are in the description below. Now let's get into today's video. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Market Mindset. It's Andrew, and uh, we're joined with Corey D Diaz, who is the CEO over at Anfield Energy. Uh, we haven't spoken to Corey for probably eight or nine months, but talk about great timing. I think everyone will remember the David Talbot interview where he came on uh, Digging Deeper and spoke about uranium and the opportunity there. You know, not only because of our incredible needs for energy and looking to the green future that we're all wanting, but also because of the incredible and uh, horrific impact of the war between Russia and Ukraine and what that means in regards to the entire energy market, not just oil and gas, but definitely nuclear. So let's get in, talk to Corey, ask about some of these things, how it's affecting business. Uh, because if you remember, uh, Anfield had very near-term assets uh, that could be, you know, quite uh, interesting at play right now. But let's find out right from Corey. Hi, Corey. How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. So you, you guys have got a lot of news releases out in the last, you know, eight days, 10 days, um, you know, not only with the mill that you, you picked up from Uranium One before, uh, but on two of your assets. Where do you want to begin? Because there's lots of news. Uh, there's the, the Biden infrastructure bill. There's the war in Ukraine. These are all, uh, there's positives and negatives as far as the world goes, but it all looks very optimistic for Uranium. It does. And, and it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, war uh, kind of helps to spur um, opportunities in the sector, but uh, that's just the nature of uranium. Um, obviously, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, is something that nobody would want to see, but it's clearly having an impact on the uranium market, uh, given that, uh, you know, Russia is a supplier of both, um, you know, U-308 and enriched material. Uh, places like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, uh, which fall under the influence, uh, regional influence of uh, Russia are also going to be impacted because ultimately uh, a lot of that material will flow through Russia to be enriched before ultimately ending up in Europe or the USA. So uh, there is a significant impact, uh, obviously talks of sanctions, uh, oil and gas is obviously on the table now or natural gas, uh, but there's the potential for uh, restriction of sales uh, of uranium uh, to the West, uh, either the West imposing those sanctions, uh, limiting, you know, material coming flowing west or Russia deciding to impact the flow of material flowing west. So uh, that's why you're seeing an increase in the uranium price. But it's once again, something we've talked about in the past. Uh, uranium, uh, it's, a, it's a commodity which has geopolitical risk. And uh, we've talked about it many times, you know, Uzbekistan, Russia, Kazakhstan supply about, you know, close to 50% of the material that's used uh, annually. And there's always, uh, there's always been a risk uh, that that material flow could, uh, could, could stop. And we've always pushed for more domestic uh, flow of material, uh, especially for US utilities, because uh, there is always a risk of supply chain um, impact. So, so from our view, this is something that has always been uh, a, a giant risk and it's just now coming to the fore. And I think, um, you know, it's not chickens coming home to roost, but in some ways it is. I think that we need to understand that uh, you know, depending on foreign uh, you know, issuers or companies or entities to provide material, um, you know, very strategic material uh, is a very risky undertaking. And so uh, this should help spur production coming out of the U.S. and dependence on U.S.-based material. And not only with uh, Biden's infrastructure bill, which does include, you know, grants and whatnot as far as nuclear the Democrats in the past have been pretty anti-nuclear, but Biden's been very, I won't say he's cheerleading it, but he's very, very much open to it. Um, and then, of course, with this Defense Act that uh, has kind of highlighted the, the, the need for the U.S. to uh, kind of enforce or to create its own critical metals and to have its own supply chain, uh, nuclear uranium fits right in there. I mean, obviously, uh, uranium is obviously a critical uh, 
metal element for the U.S., not only for enriching, for if you were going to look at weaponry, which we'll leave that alone, but energy. I mean, everyone can see today there's an energy crisis. They, it's, it's not hard to, to, to see and to find. And you talked about this before, and it's in recognition that if you had something that was ready to go when they're ready to kind of you know accept that this is a, a fact that's occurring, then that would be a good catalyst for the company and for the assets that you had. Correct. Um, you know, I think uh, there are a couple of ways to look at it. Obviously, given where the market is, uh, it, it has um, given us some greater opportunity, not only um, uh, looking at the assets that we have uh, in Wyoming, but more importantly, looking at the assets, you know, over which we have, you know, significant control or total control. I think um, another part of the equation here is that it's very limited in terms of the number of places where you can process uranium uh, in the US. Uh, there are only a handful of, of uh, producers and air producers. Um, the, the ability to control your own production is paramount in this market. Um, it's fantastic to get resource in place and do economics for resource, but those economics still have to tie into somebody else's facility or your own facility. So from our perspective, uh, as much as a place like Wyoming is very appealing, for Anfield, the more appealing thing right now is that we've got the mill over which we have control through which we can put our material, our own material or third party material, but ultimately we can control the timing as to how that goes through. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of the key for us right now. And that's why we've been putting out news, just revisiting that side of our portfolio. Uh, the hard rock material that we have, we've got significant amounts of uranium that can flow through the mill over a long period of time. So we've got a mining mill complex, which could run for 20 years or more, which I think is critical. And this is something that we control compared to, you know, assets in Wyoming, which may have kind of a near term uh, interest in some ways, but we ultimately don't control the timing and, and the throughput um, of the material through a third party uh, processor. So um, another critical part is the fact that we've got material uh, in Colorado, which are more vanadium mines than they are uranium mines, uh, but with the uranium price and both the vanadium price going up, we've got you know ore which is worth you know between four hundred and fifty and five hundred dollars per ton, uh, yep. which is incredible, um, given that we need to ship it to the mill. I mean, if our costs are you know forty to fifty percent of that, we still have a significant uh, amount of of uh, cash flow coming out of those assets. So. I think that's kind of a, a big part of the opportunities that we're seeing here is that we see a lot of uh, material that can not only flow through on the uranium side, but also we've got a lot of coverage on the vanadium side to cover any excess costs which may uh, occur uh, through the, uh, the sending material from Colorado over to our mill. So uh, we're pretty excited about what we can do on the mill side uh, to refurbish the mill and get that material going through the mill. And you've obviously been able to tell that story very well. I'm not only did, did we understand it over here, but you're able to raise uh, like or close just over 6.1 million uh, near the first week of March. Uh, so that was able to convince <laughs> a lot of people to put money into the company that see the the need and to tell that story, and have been able to uh, you know fill up the coffers so that you can you know kind of get into this next stage um, with the the mill. I mean, that, to be able to convey that to, to people that you have that. That alone is very interesting for a company at 14 cent stock. You go, okay, wait a second. This is like, how does this happen? <laughs> and this is, this is what can happen in the mining sector when people don't pay attention to it for very long. And we know, and we've talked before, is the price when uranium goes, it goes, yeah. uh, certainly in the past. Now, I, may, I don't know if it's going to do the same sort of way up uh, because I think the world is starting to realize if we're not going to use any of these other energy sources, uh, which seems to be them holding the line on you have the only solution right now is, is, and, and regardless of if whatever, it's always has to include that nuclear component and, and uranium at the end of the day. Correct. Uh, you know, uranium is the, the cleanest baseload power source in the world. And so, you know, it's great to have wind and solar and everything else, but those are intermittent sources. So you still need to have a baseline power on top of which you can you can put wind or solar. So nuclear is not going away. In fact, you know I'm, I'm sure that Germany is probably revisiting the idea of, of uh, 
you know, mothballing its fleet of nuclear reactors. Um, certainly, you know, France is looking to turn back on. You've got uh, the UK has talked about, you know, increasing its nuclear capabilities, uh, you know, power-wise uh, by 2050. You've got Eastern Europe building new reactors. So it's clear that, you know, everyone's looking for an off-ramp when it comes to avoiding uh, dependence on uh, Russia and, and its uh, commodity sources. So I think from that perspective, it's telling us, you know, there's a, it's a great story that's, uh, that's building. I do think that the price will spike even more significantly than it did last time because there are very few mines coming online and there are many more reactors being built today and very little material uh, available to fill those reactors. So I think this is a whole, you know, not only um, are we talking about the same reactors previously looking for material, we're talking about, uh, you know, companies that are no, or countries that are no longer looking for oil and gas or natural gas having to find a new source. So, you know, there's gonna be a huge run on uranium um, because people will need that in order to fulfill, uh, you know, power needs going forward. So I, I think it's gonna have a, a huge impact. I mean, it's been a fairly steady move up recently, uh, but that, you know, the spike is coming in my view. So this upgraded uh, resource uh, that you could put out just uh, like a week ago or so, uh, and this, uh, you know, an average rate of 0.197%, uh, equivalent, you've added, uh, what is it, another 1,367,000 1, uh, tons of, of material. So you've added a lot right there, just in the numbers. Yes. Yeah, so we had, you know, we acquired these pounds back in 2018 from Cotter as part of the same Charlie transaction. And obviously these assets fit perfectly into the mill, by the way, only one of three licensed, permitted and constructed conventional uranium mills in the U.S., uh, also provides even greater scarcity value under, uh, you know, current pricing. Um, so I think it's important to note that, uh, you know, as we talk about the idea of producing and producing using your own facility, there are so few out there that, uh, you know, if you're able to to acquire one or hold one or, or use one, uh, it, it should give you a significant advantage. And certainly we haven't gotten full value in the marketplace for, you know, it really hasn't been acknowledged in the marketplace that we we are an owner of a mill. So um, I think that's critical. But once again, going back to West Slope, those pounds, uh, you know, we, it was 11 million pounds of uranium, 53 million pounds of uranium that we acquired from Cotter uh, years ago. And, you know, we're just starting to upgrade those resources. And these mines have run in the past 10 years. So it's not like these are mines that, uh, you know, we're looking to, you know, yeah figure out a way to get material out of the ground, it's been done and, and done relatively recently. So, uh, and that's always been our motto. We don't go after you know, exploration properties. We go after properties which have been mined or have re historical resource have been historically mined. So uh, once again, you know, we were just essentially upgrading it to NI43-101 standard in order to confirm what's there. Yes. And, you know, we're going to start adding economics to it. Uh, in order to show, you know, the real value of that material flowing from West Slope to our mill. On top of that, then as well, you're also advancing the Velvet Wood project too. So there's there's lots happening, at least certainly as far as your announcements of things that have happened in the last month. Uh, lots of different uh, milestones are being hit in quite a hurry. So this steps with Velvet Wood is another aspect that people can pay attention to. That's correct. I mean, I think we're looking at Velvet Wood has always been the jewel um, in our portfolio, our hard rock portfolio, just because of its past production, 4 million pounds of uranium, 5 million pounds of vanadium. Uh, its relative proximity to the mill, it could serve as first feed into the mill. It's relative high grade compared to a number of other US based projects. Uh, you know, there are lots of good aspects uh, related to Velvet Wood. And so, you know, our aim is to, you know, uh, get velvet wood up and running. You know, it's it's advanced in terms of the uh, the permitting process. Uranium One did a lot of work back in the 2008 2009 timeframe. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies done that you know, that are required in order to get that uh, large mine permit. Uh, and so we're not starting from scratch here. We're talking about you know it could be you know a, a year to 18 months. Uh, you know, potentially to get that uh, fully permitted. Whereas you know if you had to start from scratch, you're looking at more like four years. So uh, we're actually in a really good position there. And this is all, um, you know, that's not going to be the bottleneck. You know, the mill is probably going to take 24 months to get up and running. So this will be ready 
as soon as the mill's ready. So we're not uh, we're not having to wait for uh, you know a mine to be available uh, once we've got the mill up and running. Uh, you know we'll have the mines available um, to start shipping to the mill. So so we're actually in a really good position from that perspective. And it is such a unique position to have the mill as well as an asset that you can develop in that type of time frame, which some people yeah. might think, oh, a couple of years, that's pretty long. That's lightning fast in mining yeah. in the mining world. Yeah. Uh, and if you have a type yeah. of situation that we're kind of facing, uh, that these are required, like this energy is needed. It was needed, you know, I would argue six months ago. Uh, there'll be, I, I suspect and hope that there's going to be a big push uh, here in Canada. And we've seen that they're going to spend $2 billion towards electric vehicles and whatnot. And there's that whole story. Uh, but in there, logically, we should be talking nuclear as well. But in the States, especially, they're being much more vocal, kind of what we were hoping that they might do a, a year ago when we were speaking. But we're seeing this uh, this shift happen now very quickly. And uh, having that, I, I can't say enough, like it's having that kind of infrastructure, the, the mill, the ability to process it, and you're in the U.S. That's another major, major bonus. Absolutely. Um, you know, Canada is a bit trickier in terms of, uh, you know, getting permitted, et cetera. I mean, there's not been uh, a lot of infrastructure in terms of processing uh, being added into the market in Canada. And so that's always been a limitation when it comes to, uh, you know, looking for resource, developing resource in Canada. Um, you essentially have Cameco, uh, Denison, a couple other parties, uh, you know, with one mill or one processing facility. Um, or you know, controlling the processing in Canada, uh, leaving a lot of other players on the outside looking in. And it's very expensive to build these facilities and, and time consuming. So it's tough as a publicly traded company to kind of you know, create that path and follow that path um, without you know, creating investor fatigue, I think. And so that's where we see the advantage yes. in the US. That, you know, things are relatively quick. Um, you know, once again, our view has always been, you know, why reinvent the wheel if we can acquire something that is very advanced that's what we'll do and that's what we've done all the way through um, yes i think it's from my perspective i've been in capital markets for 20 years i've done m a work and private equity work um i've identified assets to acquire and that's what we've been doing here that's been you know my primary role is to find assets which fit together and then those assets are all you know ultimately we're looking to find ways to um, you know, turn those assets into something else that's more advanced and helps us, you know, kind of advance the entire company um, in a way that makes sense, um, you know, to ultimately reach the goal of producing through our own facility. And so that's what we've been working on. That's what we, we continue to work on. So um, I think it's, you know, the U.S. lands itself to that kind of, um, you know, movement and, and uh, transaction. There's a lot of transaction ability here. Um, which you may not find elsewhere is yes you know, we found a way to uh, you know start with a mill get other assets in you know which uh, complemented uh, what we wanted to do with the mill but also having third-party assets which could potentially you know create another cash flow stream uh, but we're also you know looking at things like you know what ultimately will create an even bigger opportunity for us on the hard rock side because that's ultimately where we need to be especially where the uranium price is um, you know, and, and even vanadium. So, you know, we're, we're all about, you know, creating kind of the, you know, this perfect uh, entity, which is underpinned by the mill, which I think is ultimately, um, you know, the, the, the strongest place for us to be. Now, with the amount of news releases you've had out, kind of hinting at a lot of milestones that are beginning, you know, happening fairly soon ahead, <laughs> what are some things that someone could focus on to say, Okay, I get it. I remember you, you guys chatting before. I see the, the potential here. What are they looking for short term in the next couple of weeks or a month or a couple of months that they should be watching? Uh, I mean, that you can say, like, like are, are you, you know, I always ask, are you waiting for assays? Are you waiting for this? Are you waiting for that? So that someone says, okay, I can see they're on a run right now. Uh, and I understand the, the play. What should, what should kind of barometer, I suppose, you know, should they be holding up to see, are you meeting some more milestones uh, that you're talking about for your, your bigger vision? Sure. Uh, you know, I think from our perspective, you know, having to um, kind of look through our portfolio with that lens, that COVID lens, you know, it really did kind of sharpen our focus on uh, the hard work side of our business, because ultimately we want to control our own destiny when it comes to production. So I think, you know, as investors, you know, pay attention to what we're doing. I think you'll kind of, you know, that will play out even more and more 
uh, going forward. You know, our, our commitment to that side of the business, our commitment to, um, you know, controlling our production. Uh, those are the things um, that, you know, investors should, should really look for and, and care about. Um, because ultimately, as I said, there are so few companies out there with the ability to process material. And we are, uh, one, very close to being able to do that, you know, through the refurbishment of our mill. Um, so that is kind of where our focus is, and, and we're going to keep driving that focus. And <clears throat> excuse me, everybody understanding that, uh, you know, everything that we have in our portfolio um, is transactionable uh, in a way that, you know, we ultimately want to create this this uh, mine and mill complex on the conventional side of our business that is a long term business and sustainable. And so, you know, that's something that investors should be paying attention to. Well, excellent, Corey. The market is primed for this. Uh, and I remember we talked, you know, a year ago was setting the stage and having this uh, this thesis that you've had, and we're starting to see it start to move, really catch momentum. And it's when you, whenever you're dealing with government, it's tough, you know, to to <laughs> to know when or what they're going to do, or why aren't they pushing this forward? I don't understand. And, and we've had those conversations. It certainly seems like the catalyst has started. It's starting to move. And certainly, I think whenever you can raise, you know, six million dollars uh, into a company, that also shows that analysts and people covering the stock and people that uh, are, are that you're talking to are also seeing this opportunity. And uh, hopefully, uh, that is true. That is the case. I see it happening, and we're we look forward to seeing all the news coming out, especially from that mill side, because I imagine as soon as you start, you know, down that path, the calls you're going to be getting. Uh, from third parties to, to use the mill will also be will be a huge opportunity. So there's so much happening now with you. Uh, it'll be great to catch up and to find out each step of the way uh, how things are progressing. That'd be great. I'd be happy to share it again um, you know, when you decide you want to have me on again. Happy to be here. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Corey. I really appreciate you taking the time to tell us about what's happening. And everyone, check out Anfield's Energy, uh, and we'll we'll look forward to speaking to you again real soon. Great. Thanks, everyone.